Welcome to Connecting the Dots, a non-traditional legal program with your host and trusted advisor, Elizabeth Miska, your guide through the web of life's dilemmas. Welcome to another edition of Connecting the Dots. I'm your host, Liz Miska. And today I welcome uh, a new a new acquisition <laughs> from me, <laughs> from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Welcome guests, will you introduce yourself? Thank you, Liz. My name's Mimi Scheller, and I'm the Dean of the Global School at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and I'm a social scientist by training. Awesome. Uh, dean of Global... The Global School. The Global School, okay, what, what's that? That's the newest school at WPI, and I'm the inaugural dean. I've been there about two years now, and it's our school that immerses our students in the world. We have uh, global project centers all over, over the world, about more than 50 of them, and our students are working every year in 34 different countries doing team-based projects which are kind of like intensive research projects and our faculty advisors travel with them and it's a really exciting program. So you are a social scientist, so how do you incorporate social scientists into, pardon me, an engineering school? <laughs> yes, it's known as an engineering school, right? Tech, right? Exactly. We're the tech school. Exactly. But um, back in the 1970s, uh, WPI made what's called the WPI plan and it was to require all of our students who are doing what we call STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, math, to also do a humanities and arts requirement and a social science requirement and a project, a team-based immersive project. And gradually that became more and more global. Initially, we started off you know, locally and here in the US, Washington, DC, places like that. And now it's over the years expanded and the students get trained in social science methods before they go out on their projects. So we have a whole faculty of anthropologists and sociologists and geographers, wow. and they work closely with the students because the projects are at the intersection of technology and society. Wow, okay, I did not know that, and thank you for that. Because again, I always think of, of, of WPI students as being, you know, immersed in, in equipment and uh, automation and not not interacting with people. Oh, <laughs> no, they have to interact with people. And of course, that is linked to my whole field of interest in mobilities because it's about that interaction between technology and people that's so important. So tell me about, about your research on mobility because I know when you and I spoke uh, previously, you talked about mobility justice, which I had never never heard that term before. And being a lawyer, I'm obviously interested in the word justice. Um, yeah, it's a it's a relatively new term, and the field there's a, a field of mobilities research that has been around for about 20 years, and we were very much um, interested in the inequalities of mobility of who is able to move and who isn't, or how does our environment support some people's mobilities and not others? And so the word justice began to sort of come into play, kind of like words like environmental justice or climate justice that maybe you've heard of. And we started thinking about mobility justice. What would it mean to have more um, equitable mobilities? And that includes transportation, but it includes larger issues of just the design of the whole environment and all kinds of travel from the local to the global. I'm just thinking that recently, uh, over the past couple of years, really since COVID, uh, I've been working with medical students on um, clerkships and the social determinants of health uh, have been prominent. And I'm thinking that that has applicability to what you're describing. I don't know quite how, but... <laughs> exactly. No, good intuition there. Um, because, I mean, the social... its You could think of the social determinants of mobility. Right. And that we all have different um, bodies, different identities, different um, perceptions, different capabilities. 
And a lot of these are socially determined. I mean, of course, you know, you can think of basic design like, okay, a staircase. And we know that for people who have certain kinds of physical right. um, impairments or challenges, differences, a staircase is not very helpful. Right. And so we have elevators. That's a social determinant of mobility. But bigger things like access to public transportation is also it's a policy decision we make, an investment we make. and that can have a big effect on people's ability to get around. I'm immediately thinking, uh, I grew up in Holden, which you know, it's a suburb of Worcester, uh, in, in a you know, middle class neighborhood. I had a friend whose mom did not drive. And so this is when I was a teenager. Um, my friend said, well, let's take the bus. And I thought, <gasps> <laughs> the, the bus is for poor people. <laughs> no, I never, I just, th th that was the connotation that, yes. you know, like what was wrong that you didn't drive? And now I no longer can drive. And my perception of transportation, like, like the bus, has completely done a 360. But I would, I would imagine that's also part of the social determinants of mobility as well, the perception of, Yes. You know, it, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you expand upon that. Well, no, that's a great um, observation because we we live. I mean, historically, the United States became an automobile dependent um, built infrastructure, right? We, as we suburbanized, as we built highways, uh, certain decisions were made about federal investments and urban redevelopment, and and I'll go back to say those things were very racialized decisions, but those decisions were made in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and we ended up automobile dependent, except in the inner city areas that were kind of left behind in a way and bypassed, and those places were bus dependent, mm -hmm, you could mm -hmm. say. And so busing came to have this, uh, what we think of as like a stigma. Negative. And it's a negative connotation, okay. and we didn't invest as much in buses. Um, in, you know, this would be in the 1970s and 80s right. and 90s. And since then, I would say in, in the 21st century, there's been a kind of rediscovery right. of the importance of public transit, of buses, partly because of climate issues, climate change, but also air pollution and tra just traffic and all the kind of issues that we have in cities. And there's been a bit of a re-embrace of buses. I would also imagine affordability as well. It, it costs a lot of money to maintain a car, yes. park a car, <laughs> own a car. <laughs> yes, and it's gotten more and more expensive, right? Like the, I think the average price of new car cars has like gone up incredibly in the last five to ten years even and so it and and then all of the services and the maintenance and everything that goes with it sure so it's very expensive now to maintain a car so more and more people would like to have more options and we would love to be able to design cities that have more options more what we call affordances more different ways for people to get around, whether it's walking, bicycling, taking trains, buses, um, uh, e-scooters, ev everything is on the table. You're, you're also making me think, uh, I think the first time that I heard you speak was at a Worcester Now Next uh, work group, and I believe that was the, the work group about mobility, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Yes, <laughs> I believe. And that has been fascinating for me to listen in because I was never I was never plugged into any of that before. Not that I was disinterested, but I was never plugged into that. And just hearing the the different I hate to use these the, you know lingo the stakeholders, what what you know people are like oh yes I I support that but not in my backyard <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and uh, transportation in particular oh there should be there should be more public transportation there should be this but I'm not willing to give up my car and I'm not willing to you know move from you know the, the outreaches of the city into the city center because I'm, I'm I I have I have privileges when I you know have the car to live in the, the leafy street. Yes. But <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, it's wonderful that Worcester has a new, fairly new Department of Transportation and Mobility. Yes. Um, I think it was created a couple of years ago. Yes. And a new mobility action plan is under development. 
and it's exciting times here because there's you know these what you could call almost these classic cities um, that have a good central uh, walkable and bus friendly structure to them and then a lot of highways were built mm -hmm. around them and near them and it changed commuting patterns it changed where people live where people work and we now need to reinvent that and yes. that's what the city is trying to do like other cities across the country at the end of March, I, I and several of the members of the Department of, of Transportation and Mobility and the consultants that have been hired by the city took a walk uh, around uh, Worcester. And we started downtown, and then we headed out uh, going down Main Street towards Clark University. And I was, and then we ultimately ended up um, going to the hub, getting on a WRTA bus, and going out to what I know is Great Brook Valley, which was, quote unquote, the project <laughs> you know, back in the day. What struck me during the walk was, this was 10 o'clock in the morning, a beautiful day, a, you know, winter day, but a beautiful day. In some places, the sidewalks were great, but there were no people <laughs> you know, other than us, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> so, so to your point, uh, you know, the infrastructure, creating, creating the sidewalks and walkability, but how do you get people to walk, you know? <laughs> and then being on the, the WRTA bus, I, I, as a blind person, never could have done that by myself because there were, there were no um, audible cues for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it wasn't, again, despite what I said earlier about, uh, you know, my, my attitude towards buses when I was, when I was a youngster. It's like, oh, you know, this is, this is for poor people. I, I felt I felt very comfortable on the bus. I felt I felt safe on the bus. People were coming in. The bus driver knew the people coming in on the bus. And, and again, it's free fare right now. Um, but I was thinking to myself, it would be a tall order for me to do this on my own uh, because I would need I would need sighted assistance to do this. Anyway, I um, but I'm wondering just to bounce it back to you. The students that you have worked with, are you working with? I, I, because there was a young man from Clark who was very, who said, I don't own a car and I never intend to own a car. And uh, because of, of you know, the issues that you mentioned before, um, pride in the environment, wanting, you know, wanting to, to, to his, wanting to have his life to be purposeful and not just mm -hmm. cop out. Do you find that that the generations that are that are college bound or in college now, do you find that that's more of their their bent? Yes, I mean it's a mix. It's a real mix, I have to say, because there was a generational shift um, that started around 2007, actually, where there was a decrease in drivers licensing among teenagers and there was a decrease in the number of miles driven per person kind of nationally and it went down from 2007 to about 2014 and then it started to go back up again and there was a moment when there was a lot of um, promotion of um, city centers and the live work play you know right. city and people Centrally moving local. back right. and, and not being car dependent but that also is expensive and it's linked, some people link that to gentrification processes. And so whenever there's um, economic pressure, then you might see actually some of the young people, well, they, they need to live at home with their parents who might live in the suburbs and then they're still car dependent. So despite maybe a desire to live you know, downtown um, in some of the big cities, we know that the big cities like Boston and New York and even parts of downtown Philadelphia are very expensive yeah. now to live in. So there's also been suburbanization happening at the same time as this move back to the cities. Is this part of your research? Is it is, okay. yeah. Right. yeah. And also I should say I have um, a college-age daughter and a high school-age daughter and you know the college-age generation, the graduates, I would say are very strongly into environmental issues and, and those things. I find the teenagers are, um, the younger kids are less so maybe, and actually want to drive cars again. So that's why I say it's mixed. Well, that's interesting because, again, I, I work with medical students and optometry students and, and mass academy students, and some of them are, you know, are, you know like, oh, I can't wait to get my license. And other kids are like, no, I'm good. <laughs> you know, I'm, 
<laughs> so, and, and I, again, I think back, that was many, many years ago. Um, but I was like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna learn how to drive, but it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal when I learned how to drive. It's like, wow, this is independence, this is freedom. Um, mobility is freedom. It's, uh, <laughs> well, it's freedom for some people and in some places, right? So um, for um, other places, you can have a sense of freedom without a car. Yes. And I've lived in England also for many years, and many of the smaller towns there pedestrianized their yes. main shopping street in the center of their towns, and they have great bus services. And so it was wonderful and freeing to be able to take a bus and then walk around and not be surrounded by cars in a lot of the main shopping centers in some of those English cities. And uh, where were you in England? Because I, I lived in Arundel, uh, which is in Sussex, oh, okay. when I was in college. And the same thing. I lived with a family. That there was a, a, a village center. We took the train. Uh, you know, we walked everywhere mm -hmm. and we took the train. And, and uh, you know, I didn't feel deprived. I, I, I was just, right. this was great. So I lived in the north of England. I was a professor at Lancaster University. And while I was there, I co-founded something called the Center for Mobilities Research. And we created a journal called Mobilities. And there was a big, um, you would say, like movement of people who were interested in promoting sustainable mobilities and biking and walking and all of these things. I think Europe was earlier um, in that trend than the United States. And then it kind of spread and it's come to US cities and you know mayors and departments of transportation to have some of these new policies that promote mm -hmm. things like complete streets and right, right. vision zero which is a safety policy and different ways of designing bus lanes and bike lanes so that's happening all over the world now where cities are trying to do more of that do you think because the united states is so vast in in size that it's it's more difficult than it would be in, in smaller geographic places and more, you know, condensed city centers like like yeah. Madrid or or Paris. Right. Or <laughs> well, I I grew up in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is a very um, you know walkable city, right? And there's something called you know walk score where you can look at yes. you know how pedestrianized uh, cities are or pedestrian friendly. So you could say some of the classic kind of northeast cities and, and then some of the southern uh, coastal cities have very walkable central districts and good bus systems. And then as you get out to some of the different regions that were built later, like that were built after there were already cars, then they're more spread out. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing is even Los Angeles. Los Angeles, which is a famously like car-centric city with so many highways, they've made incredible investments in bike lanes and public transportation infrastructure so even los angeles can can do it and can transform i think anywhere can do it what about behavior i think it's behavior modification because that's to my point i didn't see anybody walking and when when i'm involved in a walk audit i'm keenly aware of are, are there people walking and yeah are, <laughs> and and, and that, if they're not... <laughs> yes, and that goes back to your idea of the social determinants. Right. Because one of the, we found in research that one of the big social determinants of whether people will try, for example, bicycling to work or, or using bike on an everyday basis depends on their social network and their friends and their colleagues. If they have people around them who are doing it, then people are more likely to try it. Right. And it needs that community. It needs support. And that's what kind of gives people the little nudge to say like, oh, yeah, I could do this also. And so there's a wonderful program here in Worcester right now that um, the organization called Mass Bike um, have gotten a grant to do uh, an e-bike, an electric bike um, distribution to close to 100 people. And then they hold collective events together. Mm -hmm. And so people get the chance. Um, and these are people who um, might be low income or maybe unable to afford an electric bike, which can be a little bit expensive, and they applied and they got chosen. And they have the chance to try an electric bike, to get together with others who are doing it also, and to sort of normalize it, make it part of their routine. So that's really exciting. I'm not familiar with, with electric bikes. Are they, are they going to require bicycle racks to lock them up. Worcester, a couple of years ago, did an experiment with uh, with some bikes, and it was... No, these are 
not these are dockless bikes right okay. so there okay. won't be there's no building of any okay. infrastructure okay. to park them some cities have these bike share programs where right. you can pull out the bikes on, on a sort of rental basis and those are some they have some electric bikes in many of those bike shares now but these bikes people park at home and they're actually required um, to be able to park them indoors um, as a okay. safety measure because of course bike theft is always an issue well, um, anywhere. They, and they and that what was happening with this program which was sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce where the bikes were being left on, on the crosswalks and again for people with disabilities it became very difficult to, yes. <laughs> to maneuver so mobility was impeded not by the bikes well by the bikes themselves not by the operator of the bikes but the bikes may have been abandoned yeah uh, you know in, in the path of travel exactly uh. you're right i mean we, uh, we, there's huge problems with um some of the programs that were launched with for example like e-scooters that were um kind of left all over sidewalks and do impede um access for especially for visually impaired people yes. uh, and so there's a lot of efforts made to to regulate that just like we Reg try to regulate car parking and say you can't just park your car blocking a sidewalk of course it still happens or you can't park your car blocking a bus stop right the same thing has to happen with other kinds of smaller vehicles too you made me think uh, about college campuses as well um, because I have a, a, a walking initiative that I would want to tell you about and, and you know separately but uh, I was trying to recruit from college campuses, both sighted individuals and visually impaired individuals. And again, this is pre-COVID, but what, what the, the, the blowback was, was we've created this campus where we, the administration, have all of the services for our, for our students. So they don't have to go out to the scary downtown. <laughs> and, oh, no. and, um, and it was like, but, isn't it? No, know. that's terrible. We're, we're try, we do our best to try to link our campus and our students to the community. And actually, as part of our global projects program with, within the global school, but part of WPI as a whole, we have a Worcester Community Project Center. And we have students going to the project center, and um, it's in the old printer's building. Oh, yes, on Portland Street. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, you know, coming downtown and connect with the community, get to work with community organizations, and really um, try to bring us all together. I think that's really important. Well, I, I, I think it's... Because, again, this is what I say to the medical students. You're studying me. I feel like a specimen as a, as a, as a visually impaired person. <laughs> but I want to interact with you. Uh, I, you know, and, and the only way to interact is not for me to be an object standing there with a white cane so people can point and say, oh, that's a blind person. <laughs> you know, like, right. Well, the blind person does speak <laughs> and, 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 yes. wants, and wants to speak. <laughs> and that is crucial to all kinds of mobility planning is the argument of the mobility justice perspective is part of the justice is to have all voices at the table. Everybody needs to be part of decision making and have their voice heard and their needs and their perspectives and their opinions. Uh, and we don't all agree and we don't right. all have the same needs. And so it's important to, to have everybody have a chance to be part of that decision making process. And, and again, I, I, it's interesting when you said the 2007, it was like a, between 2007 and 2014, there was like a, a drop off on, on people driving. Um, in 2008, uh, that's when I became legally blind and that was also the subprime mortgage crisis. Mm -hmm. And I was a real estate attorney. Um, so all, so everything vaporized, including my eyesight. Oh, no. <laughs> and I had to, I had to rejigger. I had to, you know, I had to re-engineer. I had to, and that, that, that precious privilege of, of driving, I thought I'm not gonna be able to survive. Well, I've debunked that. I mean, I haven't driven mm -hmm. since, Wonderful. Since, you know, right. and, and I don't, and I don't miss it in the way that I thought I would. So I, you're a great <laughs> ambassador for our possibility to re-engineer, um, not just our streets and our cities, but how we live our lives. And exactly. that's what we all need to do. Exactly, exactly. Because I'm like, how am I gonna do this if I can't drive? Well, I'm creative, just like your your students are, <laughs> and it's like I got to figure this out, um, and I have to utilize not only the skills that I have, but I need to develop skills, but I also need to ally with other individuals 
who, who have been studying things like yourself that I don't know. It's like, oh, okay, all right. So we a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, and now we have a new concoction. Yes, and sometimes it takes a crisis, right, to make yes. us do that. And I think the pandemic disruption of travel and mobility was another sort of crisis point where people really tried to rethink um, how, how can we get around and how can we do it safely? How can we change it? How can we change how we use our streets? Who is um, an essential worker in terms of transportation? How do we protect our essential workers? All of these things were thrown open for discussion, I think. I, I, I have to, um, I'm sure we're running short on time, but just to piggyback uh, on this, when, when I started losing my sight, I moved from the outskirts of Worcester uh, downtown because I want, I, and I was always a walker, uh, but I knew that I was gonna have to surrender my driver's license. And I thought, well, I need to get in, you know, I need to get familiar with my environment. Well, during COVID, I, again, I, you know, I, I, had, I had been in my blind gig for years. So COVID wasn't difficult for me because I had already developed the skills, developed the resources, mm -hmm. had the connections. Um, I live on Elm Street. Which is, which is near Elm Park. Elm Park is my playground. So I would go down um, you know, with my PPE and, um, and it was amazing how many more people there were uh, you know, out. Yes. And, and most of them, in, in one instance, a woman came over to me um, and she just started talking to me and it turned out that she wasn't a walker, but she needed to get out of the house. And she saw me and she thought, oh, I'm gonna help this poor blind person. <laughs> and it was, in the end, she said, I helped, you helped me. That's right. <laughs> right. It was, I tried. <laughs> and it's true that together um, we create the social fabric yes. where we can all support each other in different ways, different things, and being out together and kind of build our resilience. I am looking forward to, uh, to Gio and, and, uh, and involving you in the, the initiatives that, 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 I, that I am cultivating. And uh, thank you for for coming on the show today. This is just like a little, like a little nub. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for the comment. You're welcome. Um, they can find me at wpi.edu. Um, okay. For another edition of Connecting the Dots. Please note that the information provided in this show is not a substitute for consulting with an experienced local attorney and receiving counsel based on the facts and circumstances of a particular transaction. To contact Lizbeth, Email her at lisbeth at elizabethlmuscat.com or call her office at 508-753-7681. We're online at connectingthedots.lawyer. Executive Producers, Lizbeth Miska and Jack Peacock. Producers, John Medbury and Bill Hamilton. A production of Elizabeth L. Miska, JD, LLM, in association with Compliments.